Hi, thank you all for coming. So we have Marion visiting us from the University of Chicago where he and his colleagues study a wide range of systems from human gut and oral cavity to terrestrial and freshwater systems. And they use cultivation-based and cultivation-independent techniques to answer some of the fundamental questions of microbial ecology and evolution. So let's all welcome Marion today um, for his talk, Insights into Ecology and Evolution of Microbial Populations Through Single Amino Acid Variants. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, I wouldn't have done it if I were you before hearing the talk because uh, I, I'm very, very happy to be here. Thank you very much for the invitation and uh, thanks for the great two days. I had a lot of very, very interesting interactions, uh, but I thought this, would, this talk would address people who are coming from microbial ecology and microbiology, microbiology largely. So my initial slides are going to be related to those who study the, those ecosystems from complex omics, uh, through complex omics data sets. So I apologize for that. But now you're all here. Uh, we'll go through this together. So uh, uh, I, I'm a computer scientist by training, and, uh, but I'm interested in some of the complex uh, questions of, of life. Uh, I guess most of, our, uh, most of you guys here are also interested in similar things. So uh, the talk, uh, this title, I had given this title uh, slightly before uh, we realized that uh, this title is not necessarily the best representation of our study. We generated this research and we submitted it around and now we analyzed it a little further and now we realized that we were wrong. So uh, there are things uh, I'm going to tell you, but uh, first of all, uh, we realized that uh, th this was uh, th the populations that we were trying to study I'll get back to in greater detail, uh, uh, we're uh, not single populations in the MRM. So we were looking at a consortium of things. So this part of the talk is not necessarily correct. And then when this part is not necessarily correct, of course, uh, we cannot talk uh, about the adaptive processes uh, that drive the evolution of a single environmental population. So this part goes away. <laughs> and uh, so this is kind of embarrassing at this point. The, the rest still uh, applies, but then, you know, after removing this many things, I can remove this too to protect uh, members of my lab and maybe, you know, the institution as well. You know, it goes on and on like that. So basically, we, you are going to hear about SAR-11, and I'll tell you what it is if, if you're not familiar. And it's kind of evolution uh, from the perspective of single amino acid variants, which I will define further going forward. But I used to, so I'm coming from computer science background, and, and, and my in, intuition, my insights into environmental ecosystems is usually uh, uh, develop as I go through data. Uh, I'm trying to change that. So uh, my group now, we're more interested in going back to web environment, translate some of our findings to, to, to more uh, experimental, tractable uh, uh, questions. But um, when I started uh, after my PhD, I worked with Mitt Sogin uh, at uh, Marine Biological Laboratory. Maybe you're familiar with his work. And uh, uh, I was very interested in 16 s ribosomal gene amplicons and to make sense of uh, environments from a perspective of uh, how do we uh, uh, find structures, microbial structures in, in, in these ecosystems to understand how microbes contribute to the ecosystem functioning, etc. And then uh, soon after, I realized that it was kind of a limiting uh, perspective and I needed to uh, extend my understanding uh, into these ecosystems by looking at maybe more complex data such as methagenomics. If you're, if you're not familiar with methagenomics, it's an approach where you collect an environmental sample, uh, you extract DNA as best as you can, and then you sequence everything. And then you get many, 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 many short reads coming from many different populations uh, in the environment that gives you a very complex set of data that is not necessarily easy to interpret, especially by microbiologists. So since I was intending to work with microbiologists going forward, uh, and also I'm a lazy person, first I thought we could maybe implement a, a software platform that, that would allow us to study such complex environmental data. So we came up with this platform. Now it's three years old. It's rather uh, 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 stable. And as you can see, it, ha it has a uh, cross-stitch art logo. So when you see a software platform has a logo uh, like this, you realize that it's, it must be important. Uh, and uh, so basically, uh, Ambio is uh, a platform to analyze and visualize uh, omics data. We are using it for many different purposes. I'm going to show you some aspects of it today, but uh, it's, it's about 40,000 lines of code now, which is distilled from 200,000 lines of code. So we really put a lot of efforts. I'm not, I, I don't have my uh, weird things for my carpal tunnel and radial tunnel, but it did leave behind some marks uh, other than just the code base itself. And uh, it's supported by online tutorials that uh, we write uh, so people don't need us to analyze their data for multiple reasons. Because I'm, uh, I'm convinced that microbiologists should 
analyze these complex data sets themselves without the supervision of uh, uh, computer scientists, uh, basically without complaining, uh, if I may. So uh, because we want uh, people who have the microbiological intuitions to be able to ask their complex questions to complex data, uh, and, and the, the, the way we deal as computer science with complex data is to often reduce dimensionality, fit it into some uh, model, and then try to predict things based on those, uh, those uh, parts of the data that uh, explains uh, uh, largest amount of variance. But life doesn't always work like that. So uh, I, I realized that uh, we needed to make people able to address some of the questions by themselves without needing us. And uh, it's a, it's, I will not call it radical departure. Uh, I'll just call it a departure from current software development practices because Amio is uh, like Lego. It does not offer you anything but uh, a set of tools that you can do things with if you know microbiology. If you don't know microbiology, it's extremely frustrating and, and you will get nothing from it. Uh, we get emails from both ends of the spectrum, people who thank us for uh, letting them use a tool like this and then other kinds of people who are very upset with us for not giving them any boilerplate analysis practice, but we avoid that. Uh, we, we intend uh, not to do that and uh, we don't tell people how to analyze their data. Uh, and uh, it's not easy to make sense of a 4,000 lines of uh, code base with a lot of pr tiny, tiny programs. Uh, but uh, recently I did this for our own curiosity and it turned out very useful. This is uh, uh, Amrio's own introspection into itself and trying to figure out how different concepts are linked to different programs, to different uh, modules. And when we did this, we realized that there's a lot to learn. We can even uh, focus on a concept like this that is generated by one of these programs but then uh, it, it can be used many different programs to do many different things, and, uh, and it goes like that. So we, we put together a lot of online tutorials, but we also acknowledge the fact that there is no way really reading all these material, and, and, and it, the learning curve is very steep, sadly. Uh, so uh, we, we realize people go through those and they, they are uh, not necessarily getting a lot from them because it's, it takes a lot of energy. Uh, so uh, apart from those trade-offs, that, uh, I mean, I'm here trying to uh, unsell you, I'm you, right? If you knew something about it, you now are convinced that, okay, we should stay away from it. There are trade-offs. It's a terrible platform. It takes forever to learn. But then it makes pretty graphics. So, you know, uh, that's why uh, a lot of people, perhaps that's the only reason maybe, I don't know, are interested. So we go around and give workshops, help people uh, understand uh, how could they apply AMU to their research and, and, uh, and and, and yet, we're not tool builders. My group is not necessarily a group that tries to develop software. We're, we're so not interested in doing that, but it's a byproduct of what we want to do. And what we want to do is to study microbial ecosystems in various forms. And AMIO is a way for us to uh, approach to these questions. And while we're doing it for our own science, we're trying to make sure that other people can benefit from it too, because why not? But uh, I will give you three different uh, uh, scientific uh, questions that are going on in my group, and I'll focus on one of them. Uh, one of, uh, the first one is uh, understanding microbial diversity and ecosystem functioning. We, uh, every, everyone who is doing microbiology is interested in this uh, uh, to a certain degree and different ways, but we do it through uh, genome as well metagenomics. So uh, we, we reconstruct microbial genomes directly from environments uh, by uh, relying on metagenomic sequencing data. By, uh, as I mentioned, we take a sample from the environment, we chop it up into smaller pieces of DNA because our sequencing chemistry only de can deal with so much, and then we assemble them to recover genomic contexts, and now we find contexts, uh, pieces of larger genomic DNA that belong to similar populations, so we create uh, uh, putative genomes, uh, population genomes from the environment directly. And uh, I'm not going to go through the details, but we recently uh, did apply this strategy to the human gut and to surface ocean, and we managed to reconstruct very interesting genomes that have not been uh, characterized uh, before. And uh, we're interested in uh, genetic determinants of microbial fitness. We find very similar microbial genomes that are differential distributed in the environment. And uh, one question is how and why? Why not there is a single genome that dominates ev everywhere? Maybe it was the case at some point, uh, but currently that's definitely not the case. So what are the genomic determ uh, uh, determinants can we identify to talk about what makes a, a given uh, population is slightly better than the other one? And, uh, and uh, we do it through uh, linking pangenomes uh, to metagenomes. So we, we utilize environmental omics and, and better understand uh, the phylogenetic context we recover by comparing genomes to genomes. Um, and uh, the, the final uh, thing I want to tell you about today uh, in more uh, detail is uh, 
uh, microbial evolution and uh, in population genetics, microbial population genetics. So everyone is interested in uh, microbial evolution. Uh, we're, uh, we're learning a lot, but uh, we also are very ignorant because we're coming, we're not coming from population genetics perspective, so we find our ways in very complex data sets and we came up with our own understanding. And recently I had a chance to go uh, talk to uh, some colleagues who are doing uh, human population genetics and it really helped me understand uh, what are the differences when we talk about population genetics in the context of like humans and in, in the context of microbes. So we're working with population sizes that are not comprehensible by our, uh, you know, uh, our easily. I mean, so uh, the turnover rate of these populations is very rapid. Uh, they're, uh, the, the pressures, uh, the evolutionary processes that are acting upon these populations are uh, manifesting themselves in different ways. So there are a lot of challenges. So I'm going to show you uh, one aspect of looking at things through single uh, codon uh, uh, and single amino acid variants. And um, before I uh, start, I want to thank people who contribute dramatically to this research. Because I get to talk to here, uh, uh, but, but the, the, this research was possible thanks to these people, starting with Tom Dalmont and Evan Kiefel, a grad student in my group, and Alon Schaber, another grad student, and, uh, and Özcan, who is a uh, very uh, able computer scientist who helped us dramatically throughout the entire thing. So uh, I thank these people for their contributions in front of you, and then go to the, the main question. So the question I'm going to try to discuss and, and maybe uh, 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 try to communicate is, how does the genomic heterogeneity uh, emerges within environmental populations? So, and the analogy for this is, for instance, I'm standing uh, on a piece of rock in, in Woodsall, I'm looking at the Atlantic Ocean, and I'm holding one microbial cell. And then I drop it to uh, this otherwise sterile water, this, this for the sake of analogy. And then this body of water goes around and comes in front of me in about 500 years, because you know the conveyor belt, large-scale oceanic currents, that we, we, we have uh, learned about uh, uh, from oceanographers. So uh, when this population, now, now this one cell comes back, you know, of course it's not a single cell anymore. Let's say the environment allows it to grow and create a large family of cells with it. So uh, the question is, when we take, if we were to be able to characterize every single genome in this population of uh, cells now, would they be identical? You know that it wouldn't be identical at this point because polymerase makes errors and then things happen and then some of the variants are being maintained in environmental populations and some are not, etc. So now you know this is not going to be uh, a, a identical set of uh, genomes in the environment, but uh, to what extent this level of non-identicalness start, uh, uh, start defining environmental niches and how do they partition environments? So what are the main determinants of this, uh, uh, this va variation to emerge and being maintained in environments? Because as you can imagine, this is how things like this start at the beginning. So, and, uh, and this is how speciation takes place, or whatever that means. This is how uh, organisms stop being one thing and start being m multiple things and then their uh, fitness determinants define how they distribute and then this is how things uh, flourish. Uh, uh, so this is one of the significant processes that we wish to understand. But, uh, for instance, uh, when the question comes to this level, how does this genomic heterogeneity that emerges within environmental single populations partition ecological niches? You look at the ocean and you, you have your answer. I mean, you have the answer of uh, partitioning of these ecosystems. And, and when you look at ocean, you see different parts of the ocean support different kinds of microbial uh, consortia. So, to what extent that differentiation can be attributed to uh, uh, adaptive processes, to what extent it's just random, is a very significant question without a definitive answer, which is very surprising. But you cannot say that differentiation is due to natural selection and then cite a paper for it as of today. But people wrote this paper, for instance. Hal Weger and his colleagues a couple of years ago uh, published this paper in which they did exactly what I tried to, uh, to, uh, to, to uh, tell you as an analogy. They started with a very small number of genomes and they uh, created hundreds of millions of uh, uh, generations from those with a, a, a fixed error rate of a polymerase they, they, they uh, envisioned. And then they only looked at uh, the, the, uh, the, the conveyor belt. The, the, they only considered uh, movements uh, of uh, water in the ocean. And at the end of the day, they, they saw the emergence of uh, 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 patterns in ocean. So using only a neutral, neutral agent-based model, they, they could see the emergence of environmental niches in the ocean. So this indicates, this is like Hubble's theory of biodiversity, right? 
uh, Hubble says, give me the number of species and number of uh, individuals, and I'll tell you the second most abundant uh, tree in this forest. And then it, it kind of works. That drives uh, all uh, ecologists crazy, perhaps, uh, at least at the time he was maybe making these statements initially. Now we understand that this is a great null hypothesis for certain ecological questions. And this is a great null hypothesis, too. We know this is not the case, right? Uh, evolution is taking place, there's selection, but here is a challenge for all of us to address. But how do you even address this when uh, it's extremely hard to uh, study these things uh, with empirical data? Because uh, in order to study uh, evolutionary processes that shape the gen genomic heterogeneity in environmental populations, we need three things to come together uh, uh, in, in a way that uh, is not easy to come together. One, for instance, we need uh, a population, a single population preferably, that's extremely prevalent at all geographical, uh, 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 across significant geographical distances. So uh, we want a microbial population that's everywhere in the ocean. One. And when I say microbial population, I don't necessarily say species, if you, if you realize, because uh, when I say a population, I mean something uh, much more uh, highly resolved than what we call species. What I mean, and I have a very operational definition, because some of you must be asking yourself, what does he mean when he says population? Well, we don't have a good answer for that. Uh, we, had, uh, we didn't have a good answer for that 150 years ago that confused Darwin because everyone seems to know what they're talking about when they say species, but we don't know what it really means. And then when we, uh, microbiology advanced, we realized that, well, we didn't have an answer at all uh, uh, that, that could be applied to uh, all levels of life. So we stopped saying species, some of us at least. And then uh, what we needed to say something, we started saying populations, and, and it doesn't mean anything either, but we keep saying it. So um, in, my, uh, in the context of this talk, I define populations, it's going to be a little bit technical because it's intentional, as uh, an agglomerate of cells, genome of which, genomes of which could align to the same reference context with high stringency. So what I'm saying then is kind of like uh, uh, that high stringency is defined by the mapping software that we use to map things from the environment to genomic context. So it's a very technical and very pragmatic definition, and I'm not claiming that it has any biological significance, but in the context of this talk, that's what I mean by population. An agglomerate of cells with very, 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 very similar genomes. It's more similar than, than so similar that you could dif this, uh, 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 divide a species uh, into many, many different populations. So, okay. So we need that. We need one population that's everywhere in the ocean. And two, we need uh, very, very deeply sequenced genomic, uh, uh, metagenomic data from everywhere in the ocean so we can characterize uh, the occurrence of this population and different manifestations of this genome so we can consider environmental variants. And then we need a, a way to estimate the non-synonymous variation in the environment that's likely influencing its proteome. So I'll get to all of these, but I'll start with the first one. The first one, finding a population that's everywhere in the ocean. So, we don't know uh, much about uh, those uh, populations, but we know about SAR-11. SAR-11 is a marine microbe that can make up up to 30 percent of, uh, of, 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 of surface ocean metagenomes. This is a crazy amount of microbial cells if you, if you imagine that one milliliter of uh, fresh water will have about one million uh, microbial cells in it. So when you scale it up and when you think about 30 percent of oceans being this guy, then it's, it's, it's crazy, right? And uh, thanks to Stephen, Joe, Annoni, and Mike Rappe and their efforts over the years, we have now isolate genomes that are uh, coming from SAR-11. I know you're wondering what this figure is. I'll walk you through it. Uh, but uh, we have uh, 21 SAR-11 genomes isolated and circularized. So these are perfect genomes. We're not reconstructing them from metagenomes. These, are, uh, re these represent members of those populations in the environment that we managed to bring into our lab. So we have everything nicely ordered. It's just one member, but uh, it will give us access to environment populations in a second. So when you look at this, this is a, an AMVO visualization of a pan genome. So uh, what we, every layer here represents a genome. Every uh, item, every spork, whatever we call them, uh, it represents a gene cluster. So the, 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 the presence of a mark here indicates that this particular gene cluster has a gene that belongs to this genome here. So it means uh, this part, when you're looking at this part, you, you, you can tell that these are the genes that are homologous across all these genomes, so they, are, they represent the core of, of this uh, uh, the bunch of genomes. So they, 
they have to be there for SAR11 to be SAR11. And then there are all these accessory genes. For instance, these are genes that uh, happen to be in this particular genome, but never in any other genomes. So uh, at the amino acid sequence space, they are very distinct from others. So they are singletons. They are all by themselves and uh, everything in between. So things that are defining these clades, uh, uh, these their uh, differential distribution across these genomes. So this layer here, this is coming from, uh, these colors are coming from the SAR11 literature. People have cultivated them. They uh, looked at their biochemical properties and they named them and they, I mean, they named them very poorly. Like they named them 1A1, 1A3, uh, whatever. <laughs> so uh, they did their best, let's say. And uh, they, they, now we can color them differently. The reason these colors are, as you can imagine, the organization of these genomes are only due to uh, uh, the, the gene, accessory gene contents. If you are uh, thinking from a computational perspective, you can appreciate that maybe more uh, immediately, that these core distribution of differential distribution of these core gene clusters do not influence any of the uh, 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 dimensions in which we're trying to uh, organize these genomes because they are everywhere. So no one cares about them. And no one cares about, no algorithm cares about these singletons either because they represent only a single dimension in which one genome wants uh, a little bit single uh, signal. But these here, start to organize these genomes into different clades in this dendrogram, which has no phylogenetic significance. But then when you overlay our phylogenetic understanding, they also match so nicely with this organization. So things check out so far, but it doesn't tell us anything about their environmental distribution. So if you were to expect something that's pretty much everywhere in the ocean, you may uh, imagine that it's, it must be somewhere here. One of these genomes should be uh, Th one of those genomes that, that are everywhere, because SAR11 is extremely abundant, but we don't know that, because when we cultivate things, we do not necessarily uh, uh, get the most abundant thing in the environment, et cetera, et cetera. The biases associated with cultivation does not give us, uh, do not give us most abundant things in the environment often. So how could we predict whether what we're looking for in here? So one way to do it is to use surface ocean metagenomes. So Imagine if I had uh, metagenomes coming from many different uh, parts of the ocean, then I, I could recruit reads from these metagenomes to estimate their prevalence, their abundance across these uh, environmental samples. So for this, uh, we use Taro Ocean metagenomes. And, and Taro Ocean metagenomes basically uh, uh, come from these stations. They took a yacht. They, uh, they went around. It must be very, uh, have been very painful to go around the world in a yacht. And they collected all these samples and they characterized them very nicely. They, and they sequenced them very, very deeply. And I want to take a moment here to thank these people because this is a, this is a significant effort. And this expedition changed, I think, my, marine microbiology once and for all. And over the years, next decade, people will look back and they will not even uh, uh, know what people have been doing in the context of marine microbial ecology before Tara Oceans. So they did, uh, I know there are, there are global ocean surveys, so there were other things, but Tara Oceans, I think, changed the uh, uh, rules for this game. And there are many institutions who uh, were involved in this uh, project, and uh, we are very thankful for them because it allowed us to take this pan genome and dip it in the ocean and bring it back with all these additional information. So the difference between this and this is this new heat map that emerged here. Very quickly to walk you through it, every uh, layer in this heat map represents a metagenome, represents a station, a metagenome coming from a particular station. And uh, every uh, uh, so row represents a different metagenome, and their organization is by latitude. So uh, just to uh, put this in a context, basically, if you're looking at this figure and trying to match it to that, this sample would uh, be this metagenome, and this sample would be this one, and this one would be somewhere in the middle. So basically, that's how they are organized, in a sense. And that's why you immediately see the bipolar distribution of uh, 1A1 uh, clade genomes, because that's what we would expect to see. Those are the ones that are associated with cold water. They like colder temperatures, so we find them uh, to be distributed in a, in a bipolar manner. And uh, in contrast, 1A3 is largely in, uh, in uh, temperate waters, uh, and that's also what we would expect. So everything checks out. The, the, the accessory gene content organizes these genomes in such a way that it represents what we expect from the phylogenetic analysis of these genomes. And then when we look at their environmental distribution, that also confirms that we're not really doing something very silly. So their environmental distribution also uh, seems to be uh, uh, reflective of uh, their phylogeny and accessory gene content. So far, so good. So I want to tell you something about this red one here, this, this uh, 1A3. 1A3, every genome here is uh, near identical at the 16S and ITS level. 
So these are, that's what I mean when I say very, very close related uh, things we're looking at. So uh, despite that, despite near identical uh, information, definitely at the uh, 16S level and ITS level, uh, uh, you see some variation with respect to their environmental distribution patterns, right? Uh, uh, and in fact, by looking at these, you can organize them into subclades too, but we're not interested in that because we have a very specific goal to identify a population that seems to be everywhere. And in fact, you can see that. No, you can see that here. This, this black uh, unexpectedly uh, uh, widespread uh, genome, HIMB83, is a genome cultivated from Hawaii by microarray. And it seems to be recruiting copious amount of reads from every metagenome almost in temperate ocean. So as you can see here, the read recruitment suggests that this genome is recruiting a lot of reads from metagenome. So this means it's pretty much uh, uh, in every surface ocean sample we're looking at. So this is perhaps the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the genome we're interested in. So uh, here two things come together. One, we found a population. I hope this is clear so far. Uh, we, by looking at metagenomic read recruitment, we can talk about the fact that this genome is able to recruit a lot of reads from a lot of samples. So we were looking for something that's everywhere in the ocean. Here it is. And also, uh, uh, we needed uh, very deeply sequenced metagenomes through which we could, now you will see, characterize environmental variation. And uh, it, Taro Oceans allowed it, and, and, and we see that uh, it's, it's, uh, it's very high read recruitment rate uh, in average across metagenomes. So that's all fine. But there's, uh, before I talk about how we characterize heterogeneity in the context of this genome, uh, I want to talk about another thing. So this isolate genome is a member of a SAR-11 consortium that occupies temperate uh, uh, surface ocean samples. So we cannot just take this genome as is and then rely on read recruitment statistics throughout the entire genome to talk about it in, in environmental population. We cannot do it. But what we could do is to look at the genes in this genome and then uh, their distribution patterns across environments and say, okay, these genes seem to be those that are core the environmental core, and we could focus on those genes that seem to be uh, occurring in every metagenome in which we find this uh, genome recruiting out of reads. I hope you're not, uh, I hope this is not uh, going too fast, uh, but you should feel free to interrupt me if there are any questions. If something is not clear, probably it's not clear to other people. Okay, so I'll continue. What we could do then, we could look at gene level recruitment statistics. And uh, now in this figure, every layer is a metagenome and every spork is uh, one of the genes in this genome. The organization of these genes in this uh, uh, cent circular dendrogram in the center does not reflect their uh, organization in the genomic context. So two things that are next to each other here may not be next to each other in the actual genome. But they are organized based on their distribution patterns, so we can see certain uh, things a little more clearly. For instance, you see multiple things. You see genes that are systematically missing uh, uh, systematically fail to recruit reads from metagenomes. Why is this? How come there may be genes in this genome that are not recruiting anything from metagenomes from which this genome itself is coming from? Well, this kind of gives us an uh, 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 idea about the complexity of the environment. When you even talk about populations, when you even reduce it to a level of a single genome, this is what you see. The reason these genes are not recruiting reads from the environment is not because they are missing from the environment. They are there, but they only represent a small fraction of uh, the uh, population. So you know how I said uh, a population an agglomerate of cells, and there is a subsection of that population, a subpopulation, from which this genome is coming from, and they carry out genes that are not necessarily shared across all members of this population because they are not necessarily uh, 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 determinant of their existence in these environments, but they may respond to some environmental change and they may bloom thanks to those genes we don't know. But those are hypervariable genomic islands that are well known to marine uh, microbial ecologists and marine microbiologists. And there are some other genes that uh, distribute rather uh, as a function of the environment. So sometimes you find them, sometimes you don't. And uh, in fact, uh, if we had time, we could talk much more about those. But, but more important, there are some genes that are systematically detected in every metagenome. You find the uh, uh, population. So those are the genes that we could rely on because they are always there. So when we, we, now we can use them to look at the environment and manifestations of those genes in these environments to say something about variance we observe these uh, in, in these stations. So that's what we will do. 
But the third leg of uh, uh, the stool that I uh, tried to describe at the beginning, we need three things. We need this genome, we need metagenomes, uh, and, and we need something that would allow us to characterize environmental variation within the context of environmental populations at a level where we can tie it back to uh, the functioning. So what I'm talking about is non-synonymous variance in the environment. So people study uh, variation in environments, and what we do, we generate many isolates, we compare their genomes, we look at nucleotide mismatches, and we talk about whether they are synonymous or non-synonymous, but you cannot do it with metagenomic bridge recruitment, and I'll try to convince you why. And uh, in order to characterize environmental variation in the context of this, these, this group of populations, that I don't call them as a single population anymore, and I'll tell you a little bit why, we use single amino acid variants. And we decided to do this, we developed this strategy because uh, we wanted to be able to do a very thorough job uh, to characterize non-synonymous variants. And by non-synonymous variants, I mean variation in the environment that will result in changes in the amino acid sequence and likely influence the, uh, the, the functioning of the protein that emerges from that gene. So uh, single amino acid variants are like single nucleotide variants, but they are different because they focus on explaining the frequencies of varying not codons, amino acids, uh, instead of nucleotides. So we can focus only on the gene context for this reason, you, as you can imagine. And single nucleotide variants are like the correct way of saying SNPs, uh, because uh, in the context of microbiology, SNPs don't mean what they mean in uh, uh, part of science where they were defined. We can argue about that later if you want. I always pick up some arguments here. And single amino acid variants are better than single nucleotide variants, uh, if you are interested in characterizing variation that will change the amino acid sequence. So, why? I'll give you an example. So, let's say this is a part of the genome we're interested in that encodes for a gene, and we're looking at a single codon that's encoding for serine. There are six different codons that, uh, through which you can encode serine, right? And you recruit trees from the environment, and uh, you look at individual nucleotide positions, th these variants. They don't agree fully. So variation is there. So what does this mean? Is this synonymous variation or non-synonymous? That's the question we want to address and we want to quantify at the end of the day. So you look at this. Uh, th these four nucleotides, of course they are synonymous. Why should, shouldn't they be? Uh, but T, uh, okay. And uh, is it synonymous or non-synonymous? You could say uh, how many codons uh, are there that start with T? And then there are some codons that start with T in the context of uh, this particular amino acid, fine. But uh, a little better approach to uh, go about it is to ask what is the second uh, nucleotide in the codon? Do you have, for instance, uh, a TG? Because the reference is T, uh, G and T, TG. Do, do we have TG? We don't. So then from here you could uh, say, well, probabilistic speaking, it is likely that 50% of variation is non-synonymous, but you don't even know that. You think. 50% of the variation in the environment has some likelihood to be non-synonymous because it could be also TC the next, in the next nucleotide. You don't know. So you look at the next one, uh, next nucleotide position, CG. G matches to the uh, uh, reference context. It's synonymous, right? And then you have the C, and then you don't know if C is synonymous or not, but you look at CT, and then you have CT. So it's like synonymous. We don't know, but it is very likely it's synonymous. And then you look at this nuclear position. This is how we do this. This is how we estimate uh, 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 variation and link it to uh, to what extent what we see is synonymous or non-synonymous. But we are doing something slightly different. In, because this is, in a very funny way, this is one of the byproducts of computer scientists' intuition about how to study these things. We are only doing this because there is this tool called SAM tools and it allows us to get pileup of nucleotides matching to a single reference context, and we study them. That's, that's been there, and then now we're studying environments, and we don't change that because it's been there forever, and why would, need, why would anyone need to ch change that? So that's the part that I'm very concerned about. Uh, computer scientists come up with best intentions, and uh, they turn out to be the best things that ever happened to biology and worst things at the same time. So uh, because, for instance, we do it slightly differently. Uh, we take all uh, nucleotides that are, uh, all short trees that are matching fully to the genomic context. We remove the ones that are uh, partially matching. And from the remaining ones, we look at what uh, codons, uh, what uh, uh, amino acids we observe. And then when you look at it from this perspective, exploiting the physical linkage between those three nucleotides, you realize that, well, this is 100% non-synonymous. This is, in fact, a very significant change in the environment that we were waving our hands about, oh, half of it is synonymous. It's not the case, and this is very functional significant change. So 
Uh, if you ask me how often do you see this in, in your data set, it's 22% of the time. So it's a very significant fraction of everything we see in the surface ocean when we record trees. We see this is not to be a, a negligible thing. So that's why we're using single aminoacid variants. So to put this into a better context, we did this for every gene in this genome uh, that were kind of core, and then we tried to characterize the variation in this context. And, and uh, just to give you an idea, for instance, this is one gene, and we do it across environments, and now we overlay these variants on, uh, on our genes again, because now uh, we have single amino acid variants that we can link it to the structure, and I'll talk much more about that towards the end of my talk. So basically, you get, it, uh, you get an Excel spreadsheet that looks like this. Now I'll go to the next, you know, towards right, and, and you have a lot of uh, different columns that you can identify uh, whenever there's a variance in the environment for a given codon position, what uh, single amino acid variants do you see in the environment? So this is kind of the, the summary of the raw data. So throughout different uh, codon positions and samples, what do we see? And uh, you can also ask the question, which ones are competing? Uh, what's the blossom estimates? How likely to see those uh, things to uh, vary in a given, uh, you know, how many times did we observe these variants in homologous uh, proteins across isolated uh, microbial genomes, et cetera. Or you can look at, uh, 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 you know, Carl Black Leiber divergence, like entropy estimates to see how unlikely, given the data sets, not let alone evolution, what do we see in our data set, how unlikely it is to be observed, et cetera. But at the end of the day, you get hundreds of thousands of uh, single amino acid variants that are coming from a single genome. So this data is a very hyperdimensional, extremely complex uh, uh, data, right? Because I want you to imagine for a second, what would it look like if I wanted to turn this into an Excel spreadsheet? So it would be samples and then codon positions, unique codon positions, right? And then what would you expect to appear in the cell? The cell is going to be a 21-dimensional 21, 21 vector in which you, you have frequencies of every individual amino acid, right? And then it's not enough because some of those amino acids are more functionally homologous to each other, so you can replace them and nothing would change. Leucine, isoleucine, for instance, I mean, uh, not many uh, proteins will care about that kind of change, but for instance, you can't replace leucine with uh, tryptophan because it's a very functional significant change, et cetera. So there are chemical properties to these amino acids that make them more similar or less similar, et cetera. So there is that dimension of, the, uh, of this information too. So it's a very, very complex problem. How do, how do you even uh, approach to that? We approached it multiple, in multiple different ways, but we ended up uh, collaborating with our computer scientist friends who are studying deep learning. Uh, and and we, uh, uh, they implemented an auto-clustering output layer for deep learning to be able to study uh, 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 what the data has to say uh, without any labels. So this is doing tremendous amount of bootstrap uh, and, and try to organize data into meaningful units and see how it, well, uh, the neural net performs to predict itself again. So this way you can uh, kind of converge to a, a, a set of labels that may be representative of the nature of data. So uh, we did this, and from this we get an uh, unbiased estimate of distances between our metagenomes. So I'll talk a little more about this now, but we also did this with the most simple way imaginable. We also did that silly uh, Excel spreadsheet and we use Euclidean distance to organize our metagenomes too. So the shape of this tree does not change, but uh, now we will talk about this, uh, this dendrogram and what it means. So every tip in this dendrogram is one of those stations of Tara Ocean, surface ocean. So if you remember what we did, we took all those core genes, we looked at environmental variants, and then we resolved this problem by uh, uh, comparing one metagenome to the other one based on all the single amino acid variants we rec recovered in this one versus in this one. So when you imagine that as a distance uh, matrix, when you resolve that distance matrix, you see an organization of genomes like this. And the distances between those genomes were estimated by uh, the deep learning algorithm. So when you look at this, you realize that it divides uh, into two major branches. Of course, the question is where they fall when you, uh, if you were to organize them on a, a world map, because these stations uh, are, are, are coming from surface ocean samples you saw before. But before doing that, uh, you can see number of single amino acid variants uh, change uh, across these different uh, branches. So the blue ones here seem to have more single amino acid variants, 
And red ones here seem to have less single amino acid variants. And for instance, there is this uh, group that has very, very small number of that. It's like a lot of purifying selection going on in the environment. So structure of proteins are largely preserved. Nothing seems to be changing, but we will look into that. So first, where do they fit? Where do these prototypes that we identify, uh, uh, the blue ones and the red ones? And, uh, and when we first looked at that, uh, because neither of us, t Tom and I, uh, were not uh, oceanographers, and we came up with very uh, uh, rather ridiculous uh, hypotheses about what might be going on. We thought maybe, uh, maybe I should blame only myself. I thought, look, all the red ones are on the right side of large continents. <laughs> And I thought maybe there are, you know, uh, high altitude winds that always go towards the same direction because Earth is rotating. Yeah. And then maybe they create some, uh, some fluidics dynamics downscale and then we end up getting more nutrients going off the, you know, these, these uh, terrible. Uh, uh, our friend uh, Mike Lee from University of Southern California saw this and he's like, oh, these are oceanic current temperatures. And I'm like, no. But then they were. So uh, in fact, when you, <laughs> when you overlay oceanic current temperatures, uh, you kind of see that, uh, in fact, uh, the, the, uh, well, the colors match because I colored them like that. But uh, the, the, <laughs> the branches of, of this uh, dendrogram also match. So uh, you realize that there seems to be a function to uh, the temperatures with respect to how these proteomes in these environmental populations that were so close related that a single genome uh, would give us access to them. So uh, this was very interesting because the, uh, this kind of goes against the hypothesis uh, uh, the Halweger and his colleagues put forward because this cannot happen without selective uh, pressure. But now I'm going to backpedal a little bit because I was giving this talk assuming that this is, uh, I mean, I gave this talk before in other places, unfortunately, without realizing that this was not a single population. So it, every statistical uh, you know, understanding that could have emerged from that initial gene uh, distribution I showed you suggests that this is likely a single population. But now we know that it's not a single population. And, and we now know, unfortunately, uh, it's much more complex than that. Not even just two populations. But what we're talking about is probably two uh, consortium of populations that have their own evolution slightly differently. They are coming from the same place, but now they have within themselves a lot of recombination events are going on. So when you look at these uh, environmental genomes, they are just crazy complex, but their complexity is, can be divided into two groups. And these uh, two, two groups of populations, two consortium uh, of SAR11 of, uh, that is very, very close rated, the least I can say is that they might, and, and not get stoned here, is that uh, they must have been uh, diverged rather recently. So these are near identical populations to a certain degree. They are, uh, they are uh, exist through a single genome. So it's like, you know, you look at sponges, sympatric sponges that, that co-occur in the same environment. Morphologically, they are identical. You have no idea that they, they could be different, but when you look at MLST, you start seeing that they're, the genome predicts some differentiation. So, so this is at that level. For those sponges, for instance, the speciation process must have taken place, but rather recently. They did not start diverging. But when you look at this, you can see that they are going to diverge, those two different populations, because now the response is different to an environment parameter. And then that, that fluctuation in, in time will have them different exosogenomic elements that make them more fit to some environments. So they will have their own trajectory. But we are then looking at the fork. We are, uh, what excites me with this is that we are looking at very, very closely related populations that belong to the same clade that, uh, that competitive reed recruitment uh, does not share any other reeds to other genomes. We have isolate genomes. So uh, if this is the case, then any difference we see, in fact, can tell us something about their, uh, uh, um, uh, what makes them not identical. So I don't know if the, the significance of this question emerges because we keep talking about very close rate populations. So something happened just recently to them and then they are just close rated now. They are not identical anymore. But where do they differ? And what, what's the differentiation that recently emerged? Does it respond to something? Does it respond to the environment? So uh, the, I, I was pointing out the fact that this D for instance, this, uh, these uh, environments are so geographically distinct from each other. If we now, I, I know it's very confusing, but if this was a single population, 
I could have argued that the distribution of the proteome D and its appearance in these distinct geographies over and over again cannot be due to just neutral processes. There must be some selection. It could be that uh, ships are uh, shedding iron in the water and, and who knows what selects for, for, for the emergence of prototype D in distinct environments. But again, it can't be neutral. That's what I was saying when I thought this was a single population. But we now know this is not single, but still, whatever is making these subpopulations uh, 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 very abundant compared to other ones is due to environmental processes. So can we talk about those environmental processes is the low hanging fruit at this point. And I'm not going to tell you anything because uh, we're, we're looking into this uh, by uh, utilizing uh, some biochemical uh, insights. We're trying to understand where does this variation fit in the genomic context by doing something that I like very much. That uh, we take uh, individual uh, genes from this genome for which we have meaningful templates in PDB. We do dynamical modeling using, using those uh, 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 templates and then we get a structure and then you, we overlay uh, those single amino acid variants from the linear context of the genome onto these structures. Now we have an understanding, because we have a structure, which amino acids are buried in the, in the structure, which ones are exposed to solvents, which ones are on alpha uh, helices, which, which ones are on beta sheets, which ones are on occurring uh, the, 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 uh, the parts of proteins that are linked together. So uh, rigidity of the protein is defined by uh, maybe uh, some of those but not others. So, this gives us an insight about where these variations uh, fit. And for instance, we have uh, four different uh, examples here. We see things like this. For instance, this purple, uh, the, the uh, solvent accessibility is defined by these colors. And, uh, and for instance, the, the purple, that's the buried amino acid according to our uh, uh, prediction uh, of uh, the fold of this uh, uh, gene. Uh, it seems uh, it has, uh, it's variable only in colder temperatures and not in warmer ones. And then you look at this, for instance, this one, this is a timberal protein. So the inside of this protein is very significant uh, for its functioning. So you cannot uh, play with that much, but as you can see, you don't see any purple, but you see tremendous amount of variation on the outside. So these outside parts, for instance, you can now argue they uh, describe different subpopulations. So this is why, where they differ at this point. The divergence between them are maintained by perhaps neutral processes that do ne not necessarily influence the functioning of this particular one. Then you look at this one, for instance. That's a different story. The coldest uh, sample C has uh, a lot more variance and, and, in fact, very interesting places too. And when you go back to biochemistry from 30 years ago, where people studied individual proteins and said, <laughs> Uh, if a protein needs to retain its functioning in colder temperatures, you need to replace smaller amino acids with larger ones to maintain a level of rigidity uh, for it to maintain its functioning. So we are seeing things like that that kind of uh, make sense in the context of all the biochemical understanding. So this, in fact, and finally, for instance, this final one, uh, this, this particular protein tells you that don't pet me here, but you can, you know, you can, uh, I can maintain some variation. This is a three domain protein and it's under uh, purifying selection in the environment because whenever someone thought about having a variant here, it did not survive. So whatever it's doing, uh, this is uh, uh, clearly is relevant to the functioning of the population that carries this gene. But here, for instance, you have much more room for activities. So uh, there are uh, colleagues I, uh, uh, who are studying uh, individual proteins in the lab they, for instance, there are proteins that are relevant to bioremediation or biomedicine, and they try to improve their functioning and then think about which amino acids can we change to get an improved, uh, better yield for these guys, whether it's environmental uh, uh, recovery or, or, uh, or uh, whatever biomedically relevant question. So, and uh, as you can imagine, the search space, the, the uh, Changing one and testing it is one thing, but changing two things uh, and testing all uh, amino acids, synthesizing them is another thing. But uh, now we can, what we're realizing, we can take these things and go to the environment where this experiment has been done millions of times and ask the question to nature and say, so tell us all the variants that you can maintain in the context of this uh, protein. And then we can come back to the lab environment and tell our colleagues, okay, you're interested in this particular protein, so don't do anything here because it's not relevant but you reduce your search space in tremendous quantities and, and make it much more tractable. So this is the, uh, this is the uh, thing we're realizing. And going back to 15 years, 
people, uh, Joe Thornton, one of the uh, uh, professors at the University of Chicago, I ran into one of his reviews. In this review, he was mentioning the fact that people who study organism biology and people who study protein evolution have uh, done uh, uh, these in, in, in isolated corners of science. So in this review, uh, he was encouraging people to think more about how organismal evolution is impacted by the evolution of uh, individual proteins, how organismal fitness that define our distribution uh, on Earth and our ability to occupy uh, various ecosystems is manifested by the evolution of proteins that put us together. So, uh, and they have seen a lot of uh, uh, this happening uh, in recent years where uh, biochemists who study individual proteins and uh, uh, evolutionary biologists who, who study the fitness of uh, organisms uh, have been uh, informing each other a lot. And I, I think uh, we're getting to a point where we can exploit environmental omics to have the third leg of this uh, consortium. So we can now bring in omics data to understand how organismal evolution and, uh, and protein evolution and, and uh, environmental distribution patterns and variants that are maintained in the environment could be linked together in one framework. So to, to, uh, to convince people uh, to try that in their own systems, which is very straightforward. We have tremendous amount of metagenomes from biofilters to human gut to oral care to surface ocean to deep sea uh, 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 samples people generate from hydrothermal vents. Uh, we have a lot of metagenomes. We have isolate genomes. We, have, we reconstruct genomes from metagenomes. And in fact, we did all these things initially with metagenome assembled genomes, but we realized that it's getting too complex for people to, uh, to, uh, to uh, appreciate in one paper. So we went back to uh, other things uh, in, uh, to isolate genomes so it's easier to uh, maybe communicate. And uh, to, to encourage people to continue doing that, recently with uh, Evan's uh, tremendous effort, we implemented an interactive interface that allows you to reconstruct a genome or get an isolate genome, recruit trees from metagenome, select one gene, and look at all the variants, how do they uh, manifest themselves in the environment in an interactive environment by turning this around, filtering things based on solvent accessibility or other properties. So, okay, I'll stop right here. Basically, what I'm trying to communicate, I guess, since it's not a single population anymore, I have to change my uh, you know, way of uh, uh, communicating this. Uh, but single amino acid variants are promising tools to tease apart evolutionary forces acting upon uh, naturally occurring molecular populations because now with the, uh, uh, with the use of single amino acid variants, and in conjunction with uh, uh, the, 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 the pro, uh, structural uh, uh, traits of proteins, you can start seeing which, which uh, amino acids are under the influence of neutral processes and which ones are unlikely uh, uh, to be neutral, but perhaps uh, under the influence of adaptive uh, positive selection. And, and you can start uh, interrogating these questions in a more evolutionary meaningful context, perhaps. And, uh, and can reveal structural traits that are likely influencing fitness by linking biochemistry to organismal evolution. And uh, so uh, with that, I'll thank you, but uh, I recently gave a similar talk at uh, Gordon's research conference, and uh, I realized everyone was putting the logos of their funding agencies. So we haven't had any funding so far for this. We're just doing it with the pocket money because the data is available and uh, we don't have family, so we don't sleep at night. And, uh, and I didn't want to miss the opportunity to put some cool logos, though. So I want to thank these uh, institutions for helping us go through all the trouble we had gone through. And of course, the people in my group who have been uh, very helpful and uh, very patient uh, uh, with, with all these things that we were doing on the site. And I thank you very much for your attention and time and for coming here. Uh, and I'm, I can take some questions, I, I believe. Thanks. Yeah, I know it's not easy to really what to ask. So, how did you decide that they were not the same population now? Ah, great question. So, uh, we realized that we should have done it earlier, but being ignorant about these things is both a, uh, a luxury and a challenge. So uh, one reviewer, uh, one our paper was in review, suggested that maybe we should have done a more careful job at uh, justifying it as a single population. So uh, what then we did to, uh, to understand it, basically we took all the short trees that were mapping to the tsunami context, and now we asked the question if we uh, align back these reads again to the genomic context and count mismatches. Uh, 
what's the distribution of these reads as a function of their identity genomic context. So basically, I want, I'd like you to imagine a, a, an ordination where uh, x-axis is the identity to the genomic context and y-axis is the abundance of these reads. If this is 100% identity in an ideal world, you would see something like this. So everything that's circuited by this genome is pretty much identical to the genomic context. But when we're working with environmental populations in the context of isolates, we see things like a little bit like this. So the, the peak is somewhere else because all the short trees are, but it's good seeing a single peak. So we saw two peaks. We saw a shoulder like this, and then, so it indicates the presence of a close rate population that uh, is similar enough to the genomic context to be recruited by uh, that, that experiment. So that's how we realized the shoulder, the presence of a second peak I was, uh, was forming. Yeah, we tried to, uh, to associate this with other things as well because Taro Oceans, st these stations were described uh, extensively based on their chemical properties. But uh, you, can, you can see everything is a co-dependent, you know, things are co-dependent to, uh, uh, to dependent to temperature. Uh, uh, what, what influences uh, these are likely temperature and its covariables. So temperature influences a lot of things, and there are uh, many other uh, things that we cannot immediately explain by temperature also happening in the ocean. You know, upwelling with the high nutrient uh, water coming up and I influencing things. So, but we didn't find anything significant, but this doesn't necessarily mean that, uh, that, uh, that there were no other factors that uh, could not explain this. So our insights were extremely limited, basically. Uh, temperature, uh, but in my opinion, temperature also influences something else. Temperature is directly linked to the, the, uh, the functioning of proteins at the most uh, chemically relevant physical level. So temperature will change things. When you uh, change the temperature of an environment, the functioning, uh, the, the, the constraints on the, the structure will change. Therefore, the, the structural, uh, the shape of a given protein will change, and their uh, relevance to the environmental processes will change. So the, the, the organisms that carry these proteins will start behaving differently. So Temperature has a very physic physical level uh, influence on the evolution of proteins as well. So uh, I, I was maybe thinking that uh, maybe the, uh, the temperature explains some of the variation that creates some genomic backbones with selected variants that could adapt to those temperatures, but then uh, within those populations there could be accessory uh, elements that deal with environmental nutrients, so adapt uh, to, to those within the same temperature regime. So these are very important questions, but clearly we will not be able to address them only through omics studies. We need these guys in cultivation, and we need populations that we could, uh, we could grow and test and see how these things are influenced by synthesizing genes and putting them in these genomes, et cetera. So that's, I think, going forward is going to be the only way to fully address them, these questions. Yes. So is it due to there's not sufficient variation within the Earth's Earth across the whole world to allow for more than one group to I mean the, the potential that tells there's not sufficient variation in that yeah, that's that allows that more than one. one group can basically deal with all that variation. Yeah, that is crazy. Uh, that that there is this one genome that is probably opening us uh, a keyhole to look into the most abundant microbial population on Earth, given all metagenomes and all uh, isolate genomes we have today. It truly is the case with 10 beta 3. So uh, I don't know how to interpret this, but I, uh, uh, I, my null hypothesis is that there are no rank abundance curves in ecologically saturated niches. So whenever we see something like this, it's because we haven't been able to properly identify ecological relevance units within. So. What I think is going to happen, uh, uh, that people will cultivate more and more, and that one little branch will change the entire shape of the dendrogram into a myriad of genomes that now, in fact, uh, tells us uh, a, a broader uh, 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 story about how evolution took place. Now we can access only through this one genome. So uh, 
I think it's a very significant question, but I think we have a very little glimpse of the actual picture. So this is very misleading in that sense. It's, it's very likely. But maybe, after all, there is this one uh, truly oceans present SAR-11 with a very non-diverse chemical uh, uh, requirements to be very efficient at surviving uh, in these environments, and, and maybe this is the reality. But uh, I think Steve Giovannoni would have made a lot of comments on this. Uh, He's much more insightful and uh, intuitive about this question, but yeah, I don't know. Thank you very much. <laughs>